morning grace and peace be multiplied to all my brothers and sisters everywhere i'm excited today because corporate worship is about to commence or resume and i miss all of you my family the grace workshop ministries it is my honor today to share with you the word of God and we have been on a particular subject for the past couple of weeks we have been looking at the seven churches in Asia last week the church of Ephesus was dealt with. Prior to that, it was an overview of the seven churches of Asia. Today, it is my task to share with you on the church in Smyrna. Let me begin by saying to you in somewhat of a a disclaimer that our objective is not so much to delve into a exhaustive exegesis of Revelation or the seven churches. It's more a critical analysis of each letter uh, with a view to seeing how we stuck up in relationship to the appraisers given to each church. What are the nuggets there that we can glean? What are the principles that we can extricate and apply to our lives? So this is the objective that we employ as we look at these seven churches so I'm going to go straight into the text and I'd like to start at the 17th verse of chapter 1 and then I'll read the relevant passage as it relates to the church in Smyrna which will be the second chapter beginning at verse 8 through to verse 11 Verse 17 of chapter 1 reads thus, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches chapter 2 and verse 8 to 11 and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things say the first and the last which was dead and is alive i know thy works and the tribulation and the poverty but thou art rich and i know the blasphemy of them which say they are jews and are not but are the synagogue of Satan 
fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tested, and he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an hear, let him hear. For the Spirit saith unto the churches, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. The subject of the discussion this morning is I know. I know. Embedded in the 26 words of the letter to the church in Smyrna is a society, a system that must be looked at carefully in order to be able to appreciate the purpose of the letter. We'll have to look at maybe the geopolitical socio-economical and religious atmosphere and norms and customs that are germane to the understanding of the experience of the church as they struggle through hardships and adversity and ultimate victory. The etymology of the word Smyrna is a word which comes from the Hebrew, which means myrrh, a resinous substance used as perfume for the living, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11, and for the dead. In John chapter 19 and verse 39. Myrrh captures the picture of the suffering of the church in Smyrna. Light myrrh produced by crushing a fragrant plant, the church at Smyrna was being crushed by persecution. Walk with me a little bit as I attempt to give us or to develop a historical perspective of the city of Smyrna and its environs and how the church functioned or existed in that kind of atmosphere. Smyrna is said to have been one of the oldest cities in Asia. Its history goes back as far as 1000 BC. The city was captured and destroyed by King Aletheus of Lydia in 600 BC. He left the city in complete ruins without any hope of recovery. Smyrna, however, boasts of being the first city of Asia. It was a proud city, love to talk about its accomplishments. The city of Smyrna is modern day Izmir. Izmir is the second largest city in the country of Turkey, second only to Istanbul. Smyrna was a major arbor whose trade and commerce supersedes all the other provinces round about. So it was a, a harbor city through which most commerce in Asia Minor 
would come because of its sophistication and because of its system of governance and operation in the then world. It was located on the eastern shore of the Asian Sea on the crossroads to Phrygia and Lydia. It was about 35 miles north of Ephesus. In the first century, it is said that its citizenship would have been about, or citizenry would have been about 200,000. It had the status of a free city, much like the United States today. It was a political, religious, and cultural center for all of Asia. Its science and medicine were superior to those of their neighbors. It was proud of its famous stadium, large library, and the largest public theater in the province seating some 20,000 people. It was wealthy and exceptionally beautiful, claiming to be the glory of Asia. Smyrna bragged about being the city that died and came to life again, literally, owing mostly to the fact that Alexander the Great rebuilt the city after its ruins in about 200 BC. Legend has it that as he slept near the ruins of an ancient temple that was on the top of Mount Pegasus, which is a high place in Smyrna, he had a dream. And in this dream, two spirits appeared to him which he interpreted to be a manifestation of the mother goddess named Sibyl. And the spirits told him to rebuild the city to its former glory. And so this is what Alexander did. So Alexander designed and built a city that was an architectural masterpiece. The layout, the buildings, the gardens, the streets, a matter of fact, the street that ran through the center of the city was called the street of gold. It was repleted with temples from top to bottom to all kinds of gods. The water docks, and not wanting to insult anybody's intelligence, but we're not talking about um, the bird. The water ducks were channels through which water ran from streams and rivers or lakes into the city for the utility um, of all its citizens. It was a thing of beauty that attracted multitudes from across the world. But it was all built to the honor of Sibyl, a goddess that was really no god at all. So who was Sibyl? Sibyl, according to legend, was born half man and half woman. But she castrated herself to become fully woman and was said to be the mother of all gods, of all people, and of all animals. And in Smyrna, the worship of Sibyl was prevalent, but also sensual and bloody. It involves cutting oneself, literally bleeding out for this goddess. All of Sibyl's priests were males who had self-castrated in order to become her priests, just like she castrated herself. And there were so many of them, 
in Smyrna that history records them as being like swarms of bees in the temple of Sibyl. There was no shortage of men who would castrate themselves in order to become a priest to Sibyl. I pause here to ask a question. What are we prepared to do for our God? Because Sibyl was not a real God. But these men were willing to castrate themselves so as to become her priest. Can we and are we prepared to castrate our flesh for our God? Are we willing to castrate our will for our God? Are we willing to castrate our emotions for our God? Think on these things. The life of a Christian community in Smyrna was one of tribulation, affliction, and poverty. According to Revelation 2 and 9. Two main things contributed to the miserable and life-threatening situation of the church in Smyrna. First, the city was the center of emperor worship. At the time the book of Revelation was written, emperor worship had become mandatory. So on top of all of these idolatrous happenings into which the church of Smyrna was already immersed. Emperor worship has now become a norm in the city of, Myr of Smyrna. The emperor was deified or elevated to the level of deity or God. In 26 AD, Smyrna was the only city in Asia that was allowed to build a temple for the Roman Emperor to be worshipped. In this case, it was the Emperor Tiberius, the only city Rome thought worthy to be granted the privilege of erecting a temple to Tiberius. Here is how this works. Once a year, every Roman citizen was obliged to perform the religious duty of burning incense on the altar to the godhead of Caesar. And then they were issued a certificate. Now, what this means, as a matter of fact, is if I refuse to attend the rituals and the ceremony that would have taken place on an annual basis, and for some reason someone inform authorities or just a random check and there is no certification of you having attended and burnt incense to the emperor, you would have been in problems. The refusal of participation was considered treason, the, consequ the consequence of which was likely death. So this is the atmosphere. This is the state of the city of Smyrna, and this is where the church of Smyrna operated. And the letter 
that was written to the church tells the story of their experience in that kind of atmosphere. Smyrna's were openly hostile towards the Christians in the city because of their refusal to participate in emperor worship. Secondly, the Jews, there were a large, there was a large contingent of Jews living in Smyrna. The Jews had some special privileges. The Jews were granted certain privileges as a religious group. They were exempt from openly worshiping the emperor, but they were still obligated to participate in the annual rituals. That's the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Christianity, as you know, is a half-spring of Judaism. Here was the Jews' fear. If the Christians continue to resist emperor worship and not participate in the ritual celebrations, more than likely, it would cause a spotlight to be shone on them, which could result in them having their privileges revoked because of their kinship to the Christians. And so, in their bitterness, the Jews joined the pagans in hating and persecuting Christians. They slandered the Christian before the local government, making malicious accusations, thus stirring up the pagans against the Christians and inciting the authorities to persecute them. Christians were charged with being cannibals. And why they were charged thus is because of the holy sacraments. Um, having to observe the death of Christ, the drinking of blood and the eating of his flesh symbolically. That is what they were accused of. And so this information was taken to the authorities which caused further oppression. They were also accused of being atheists because of their, refus their refusal to worship the emperor and thus were considered disloyal to the government. John depicts these Jews as the synagogue of Satan. Although in dire danger, the Christians in Smyrna were found faithful. Many of them experienced heroic suffering and death. When we look at the letter to the church in Smyrna, we, it seemed like the Lord started this letter to them, <clears throat> taking into account what he knew of the city and the boastings things that were taking place. The Lord started out by saying, these things say the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And <clears throat> these, this is a language that was familiar in Smyrna because the Smyrnians consider themselves the first real city in Asia and they embrace the fact that the city was dead at some point and came back to life when it was rebuilt by Alexander and so the language that the Lord used would have been familiar 
with the hearers because of what they know of their own society and what it is that the Lord was saying to them. The Lord also thought it necessary to introduce himself this way because of the oppression that the church was experiencing. Under the burden of oppression, we can get exhausted and fatigued that we, become, we begin now to second guess ourselves and become despondent because there was a relentless attack upon the church in Smyrna and it seemed like they could not catch a break every turn they made they encountered adversity and so the Lord understood that having been so mistreated and abused they needed to hear something that would provide for them some amount of encouragement and strengthening. And he said, these things said the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I shall not die anymore. Your God is alive and well. The Lord wanted to reassure his people that he was alive without any possibility of dying ever again. <clears throat> the next thing the Lord said, and this should never escape our minds, and this is where I want to spend a little bit of time, and if I don't go much further than this, I, I want to make this point very very succinctly and, and, and very forcefully. The Lord said, I know thy works. <clears throat> Outside of his declaration of his everlastingness, to kind of word, this is probably the most important and powerful thing that he could have said to them. The Lord said, I know Thy works. I, I know this, this knowledge of God in it is wrapped up all of their adversities, their struggles, their hardships, their tribulation. I know. I know what you've been going through. It is not an academic knowledge. It is not information that came to me by the way i know experientially I, I know intimately i am acquainted with your situation from a position of presence not in abstract not being somewhere and having information passed to me i was there when you were going through your adversity. I was there when you were going through your persecution. I was there. I know what you've been going through. And it, it, it tells me that if the Lord knows my situation as they exist, even though I'm not getting the answers that I seek at the present time, there must be a purpose for what it is that he's allowing me to go through because if he is there at some point i'm going to get the answers at some point he's going to do something on my behalf at some point because he's right there with me The Lord promises, I never leave you or to forsake you. I never forsake you. I'll always be there with you. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes 
with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 8 says, The Lord himself goeth before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord will never leave us or forsake us regardless of what it is that we encounter in life. He has a vested interest in our success. He's never going to leave us. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter what you're doing. He's never going to leave you. So when he said to the church, I know that should, that should capture their attention and say to them that though I felt despondent, though I was crushed, though I was persecuted, though I feel from time to time in my humanity abandoned, God was always with me and because he's always with me, I shall not die but live, but even if I die, I will die as unto the Lord because I'm embracing my integrity and I'm not compromising. And it is this lack of compromise which puts the church in Smyrna in peril. I'd like to read in your hearing a passage that encourages me. And I'd like it to encourage you because there's somebody who needs to know that regardless of your situation and your pain and your hardship and your difficulties and your abuse and your molestation and all the other nasty things that seem to be happening to you, God is for you and he's going to stay with you. Even in that mess, he's going to be there with you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 39. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say, then say to these things? What are we going to say to these things? If God be for us, and by if, I mean since God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Who is he that condemned? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that rise, that's risen again. Who is he even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Not separate us from my love for Christ, but separate us from Christ's love for us. Shall tribulation such as the Smyrnian <coughs> church was experiencing, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Paul is saying, the evidence is overwhelming every turn I make. I am bombarded by the evidence, so much so that I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us 
from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He knows your situation intimately. He's acquainted with your pain. Even when you don't think that he's there, he's there. Nothing can separate you from him, not even you. I want you to understand that. Not even you can separate you from God. He did not choose you since you. He chose you before you. And God's investment will always yield returns. It doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in. God, if his hand is on you, if he has selected you, if you are predestinated and determined by him, he's always going to be there. And I want you to be assured and understand that this God is not going to unfriend you. He's not going to block you because you're not doing well. He's still there with you. Even when your steps are out of line. Look at what John said in the last verse of chapter 1 of Revelation. He says that the Lord was walking among the candlesticks and the candlesticks represent the churches he was walking among the candlesticks and might i had he said the candlesticks were golden and gold puts you in mind of something priceless or precious so the lord has you as precious to him and he was walking among the candlesticks regardless of what it is that they were doing the lord was walking among them and he's walking among us there are churches that were accused of being backslidden accused of being lukewarm but the lord was walking among the church because the church belongs to him and even though they weren't where they are as they should be in God's eyes they were still, still special and precious to him because he said they were golden candlesticks the condition of the church is did not stop him from walking among them Filthy or not, he was walking. Backslidden or not, he was walking. Lukewarm or not, he was still walking because the church belonged to him. They did not choose him. He chose them. And regardless of what it is that they were doing, they belong to him and we belong to god we belong to christ regardless of what we are doing now and he's not leaving us he's going to stay right there it doesn't matter how dastardly your situation became or becomes it doesn't matter what it is that you have done and some of us our consciences block us from Reaching after God because we have failed so often, especially when we have failed over and over because of the same thing. It comes a point where we feel so exhausted and we, we, we condemn ourselves and agree with our conscience and say, God, don't have nothing to do with me anymore because I've failed and I've repented, I've failed and I've repented, I've failed. And it becomes almost like cliche now. I don't even know when I'm sincere anymore. I don't know when I'm genuine anymore. But I want you to know that he's walking among you still. He's still with you in spite of you. Because you are valuable to him. You are gold in his hands. And he's going to take you through in spite of you. 
God is determined to save you in spite of you. You can't stop him from walking. Your mess can't stop him from walking with you. Your guilt can't stop him from walking through your life. He's determined to save you. He's determined to change you. I know some of us are tired. And it seems like there are no answers available. And sometimes it seems like we don't even have the, the impetus, the, the strength, the energies to try to make that effort. But the scripture says, when we are weak, then he is strong. And our, his strength is made perfect. In our weakness. And I want you to know that. Your weakness give God, gives God an opportunity. To express his strength in your life. So that you can walk victoriously. In verse 9 of chapter 2, the Lord says, I know your tribulation. The Greek word, philipsis, basically, which, from which tribulation comes, basically means pressure. The burden that crushes. The burden that crushes. The word is best expressed in the image of one being placed on the ground. With weight being placed on the chest. Over and over. Until the rib cage breaks, piercing the lungs. Resulting in asphyxia or suffocation and death. This was the kind of pressure Smyrnian church had to endure. And I know that among us, there are those of us who feel the same way. Like there is this constant pressure being laid on you. Even while you strive to do right. Even while you strive to maintain your integrity. Even while you strive to live the life that the scripture outlined for us to live. The weight keeps coming. Till you feel like you can't breathe. And you feel like you would die. Sometimes you really want to die too. But the Lord says, I know, I know. I can't, I can't, I can't get that out of my mind because the knowledge that the Lord knows my situation intimately encourages and strengthens me. It tells me that my life has been designed a particular way. And everything that I go through, even if those, some of those things are occasioned by me, God's plan for my life will still be executed in spite of me. What a weight to have Lifted off my shoulders. It's not dependent on me anymore. That is not to say I'm absolved of my responsibilities. Because I have a responsibility. But to know that the heavy lifting is the remit of the Lord. Oh, what a liberty and a freedom to experience. 
And I want to say to my brothers and sisters, that is the liberty and that's the freedom that's yours to enjoy. The Lord's knowledge of your situation. Even if you are the one that caused it on yourself, the Lord's knowledge of your situation because you belong to him. He's coming. He's coming to get you. He's coming to get you. He knows exactly where you are. He knows where you live, and I'm not talking about geographically now. Where you are in your state of mind. Where you are in your spirit. Where you are in your mental capacities. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what buttons to touch. He knows what to use to tweak you. He knows what to do to tweak and to remove that debilitating situation that has been plaguing you for years. He knows, he knows, he knows. Be reassured that he knows. The Lord says, I know your tribulation and poverty. The Greek word for this is pushia, which, means, which denotes extreme poverty or destitution, having nothing at all. Because of their stance, because they would not denounce Christ, because they would not subject themselves to the rituals and the customs of the emperor, the Roman government, and the decadence of Smyrna. They live like rejects and outcasts. No, man, no one would do business with them. No one, because they would not submit and subject themselves to the norms that existed. They experienced abject poverty. But the Lord said they were rich. The Lord said they were rich. They might not have had this word's goods, but they were rich in spirit, in their relationship with God. And they were storing up treasures in heaven. Luke 12 and verse 15 said, And he said unto them, Take heed and be aware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. They were rich in the eyes of God. As I attempt to wrap this up, Verse 10 of chapter 2 says, Fear not of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you in prison, that he may be tried. And he shall have tribulation ten, ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This could not have been the the most exciting letter to have read. In no wise. Here am I struggling and in pain and in hardship and in persecution and tumult and tribulation and all that. Affliction. Thrown in prison. Killed. Ostracized from society. Impoverished. Hungry. This was the perfect church if there was any. The Lord had nothing to accuse them of. The Lord accused Ephesus with all the many trimmings and accomplishments that they had left their first love. The Lord did not accuse Smyrna 
of having left the first love, which tells me, because love is the first thing on God's agenda, it tells me that these people love God and that's why they sacrifice themselves. This is why they would not bow because what they were doing was from a place of love. This wasn't just a, 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 a couple of tenets or dogma passed down to them that they were embracing. And this was customs and tradition. This was coming out of a place of love. So the Lord did not accuse them of being, uh, having lost their first love because they maintain their first love. But here it is, having done all that and suffered for it, the Lord is now saying, um, you're going to have more persecution. You know? Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. You're going to go through some testing and some trial. You're going to go into prison to Satan. I'm going to allow Satan to, to try you. But, but there has to be, there uh, has to have been something about the mindset of the church in Smyrna that even though this wasn't the most exciting news, they were going forward still because it was, what they did was coming from a place of love of God. When you're going through challenges, suffering, pain, and tribulation, especially if you've been bearing it for a long time, <laughs> the last thing you want to hear is that you're going through more pain and suffering and tribulation. What you want to hear is there is deliverance at the door. That's what you want to hear. And it will seem like God is almost cruel to lay more upon a church that is already pressured and suffocating because of the weight of persecution. The hard truth of it, brothers and sisters, is that some of us were designed for suffering. It's a hard pill to swallow. But some of us were made for suffering, for God's glory, and for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul said it in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So even though I might not understand what it is that I'm experiencing and why the Lord placed more on me in spite of what I'm going through, there is a purpose that is bigger than me. Because I belong to God and he has liberty to do what he wishes with all that belong to him. So you're going to go through suffering and persecution. And, and sometimes when you hear about streets of gold and walls of jasper and crown of life and so on, it means nothing in your human ears because your pain is too excruciating for you to even contemplating to, to be able to contemplate heaven. But the Lord knows what to give to us and how much we are able to bear. The mindset of the church in Smyrna, I believe is captured by one of the most prominent citizens, a man by the name of Polycarp, who was said to be the bishop of the church of Smyrna and a mentee of John the Revelator. Polycarp ended up being martyred for his faith in AD 150, which is about 60 years after the letters were written and revelation was given to John. Listen to what Polycarp had to say when he stood at the, the stakes with a stock of wood around him in the stadium for all to see. Here is 
Polycarp's words. And I end with this. O Lord God Almighty, the Father of our beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, I bless you that you have granted me this day, in this hour, that I might receive a portion among the number of the martyrs in the cup of Christ. May I be received among those in your presence this day as a rich and acceptable sacrifice. For this cause, yes, and for all things, I praise you. I bless you. I glorify you. God, thank you that I get to be such a sacrifice. Sacrificing all, even my very life for you. This captures the attitude of the church of Smyrna. So even while the Lord placed more tribulation upon tribulation, they count it a privilege. They counted it a privilege and an honor to give their life. You can't really, really do that. If it's just traditions and customs from which you come, you can only really do that and speak these words with such passion and fervor if you're coming from a place of love. And so, this is a story of the church in Smyrna. I trust that God will enable us to see ourselves as we parallel our lives with what is recounted here and see whether or not we are weighed and found wanting. What is it that we need to do? What adjustments we need to make? What nuggets we need to glean so that we too can reach this point of dedication? We might not be required to, and I don't know, maybe at some point it might happen, we might not be required to, to die physically for her God and what we believe and her love of him, but what about the things that hurt him that we do? What about the life that we live that doesn't honor him? How many times have we hurt him and will we continue to hurt him? Or do we love him enough to want to sacrifice those things that cause him pain so that we can put a smile on his face? God bless you, all my brothers and sisters.